This is the Living History Podcast, broadcasting live across the airwaves. Hello everyone, welcome to Living History and to an episode that I'm really looking forward to because anyone who has been to the Western Front or indeed just about any battlefield where Commonwealth or Australian or British soldiers fought and died will have seen the incredible Commonwealth War Cemeteries that litter the landscape in places like particularly Gallipoli, the Western Front, throughout Europe. You'll find these cemeteries just about everywhere you go, wherever there's a former battlefield. And they're really wonderful monuments to the men that died during these campaigns and a very tangible link with the history. But it's a complicated story. That There's many different types of cemeteries. And I don't think after all this time, especially when it comes to the First World War, after 100 years, I don't think we quite understand exactly the story behind these cemeteries, why they were built and, and, and how they even were intended to work. Uh, and so we're going to delve into that today. We're going to talk about everything to do with cemeteries. And joining me for this conversation is a good mate of mine, Mr. Peter Smith, who is a uh, wonderful battlefield historian. And if you head over to the Western Front, this is the man you need to travel with because Pete lives in the Somme. And he knows the battlefields over there better than anyone that I know. So it's really great to catch up with him and talk about this and just to explore this wonderful topic of cemeteries, uh, Commonwealth War Grave Cemetery. So, Pete, thanks for joining us on Living History. Thanks so much, Matt. Nice to, uh, to chat. So, Pete, just before we start talking specifically about cemeteries, tell me what was the circumstances that the cemeteries were built under? In So we're talking the end of the First World War, for example, 1918. What was happening on the battlefields uh, that, 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 that created this incredible need for these, these huge cemeteries? Okay. Well, I'm going to start earlier than that. I'm going to start in 1914, right at the beginning of the war. And a chap called Fabian Wern, um, serving with, uh, in fact, commanding a Red Cross uh, ambulance unit. Um, obviously, men are dying uh, within his ambulance unit and he's burying them. And it became fairly obvious to him uh, very quickly that uh, nobody was overall recording where people were being buried. Uh, and nobody seemed to be thinking through of what would happen in the future. What was going to happen at the end of the war? What would they do with all of these groupings of men that were everywhere? So he went to the war office and was fairly persistent in, in, in nagging them and saying that something needs to be set up. We need some way of recording where and who we are, we, we are burying uh, because it's going to be necessary in the future. We are going to have to do something with this, what obviously became an enormous number of, of dead. So that's that's, a, really that's an important point, isn't it, Pete, that, that the scale of the losses here had never been seen in a conflict before. No, exactly. Uh, prior to this, the men were buried regimentally. You know, at the end of a battle, hopefully, if it was successful, uh, they would. Uh, you would bury your enemy, you would bury your own dead. And very often, they were treated very similar. The enemy would be buried in one pit, effectively. Uh, our own men would be buried in another pit. And their names sometimes put above it, sometimes not. But at least you knew where, where they were. A cairn built above it, a cross maybe placed on top of it, and on you went. But in a, in a war that uh, became so industrial and so expansive, uh, where you get a, a battalion, normally a thousand men, uh, for that for one regiment. And I'm talking about the British Army. Suddenly, you've got 15 battalions for for the same uh, regiment fighting in different areas, and it just couldn't be organised by the regiments or the battalions themselves any longer. You needed an overseeing body to start thinking about what was going to happen and, and trying to keep a check on where they were burying and, and also what would happen in the future. Um, so that's kind of the background to, to the start of, uh, of what would eventually become known as the Commonwealth War Graves. Prior to that was the Imperial War Graves. And before that were grave registration units. And so that's where we're going to start, really, is with grave registration units on the Western Front starting to record where people are being buried. That sounds like um, almost impossible work, given the carnage of the fighting uh, on the battlefields. How, how did they even carry that task out? Well... Uh, of course, the difficulty is this: if, uh, as many of the actions were in the First World War, unsuccessful, then the burial of your own dead is impossible. So you're you're leaving the burial of your dead to uh, to the enemy. So we can only talk about it from the point of view of uh, of burying our own dead. But the difficulty always throughout the whole of the First World War is you are not going to uh, lose living men, uh, lose lives in burying men that are sadly all, all already dead. So, so there are various problems uh, uh, with burying the dead, and that will lead to lead to the the dead being buried under various circumstances, which leads to the, the, the cemeteries that we have now being created to cover those circumstances. 
So the, the first one, I suppose, the one that everybody would think of is a battlefield cemetery, a cemetery that's created on a battlefield during uh, or just after the fighting, and, the, and it has to be successful fighting so we can bury our dead, and they are buried on or just behind or very close to uh, uh, the battlefield. So that would be the, the first type of cemetery that uh, most people would expect to see. Interestingly, there are very few uh, battlefield cemeteries because they tended to be small. And what's going to happen is, you imagine uh, this countryside uh, that, that I live in, uh, I would be surrounded by graves if they'd been left where they were. There would be graves everywhere. They'd be in my back garden. They would be in the fields uh, around me, little groupings of men. So a decision was made, uh, really led by the French and Belgian governments, that uh, groupings of men of less than 40 uh, could not exist. They had to be closed down. Uh, the bodies had to be exhumed and they, they had to be moved. Well, if you imagine, most battlefield cemeteries did tend to be small groupings of men uh, around the paddocks that they're, that they're fighting over. And so those men are going to be exhumed and are going to be moved. And I think it was one of the, when I first started studying the Great War, it was one of the big surprises to me, having seen these Commonwealth War Grave cemeteries both on film and photographs before many, many years ago when I first came out here. I just presumed that these were the last resting places of the men. This is where when they were buried, they, they, they remained there, and that cemetery I was looking at was in fact uh, uh, from the battlefield. So I discovered that in fact a large proportion, and I've never seen the figure actually written down as how many men have been uh, exhumed and moved, but a large proportion of the men that you see on the battlefield in these little cemeteries or larger cemeteries, um, all above 40, and well, a larger majority of them ha have actually been uh, moved on the, uh, on the battlefield from their original place of burial. Pete, what's an example? You mentioned there weren't many genuine battlefield cemeteries. What's some examples of ones that still exist? Yeah, I think my favourite one to go to is because it's linked to others, is to go to Polygon Wood, uh, uh, just outside of Ypres. Um, Polygon Wood contains a little, very small battlefield cemetery, uh, uh, interestingly, predominantly New Zealanders. Um, and it's alongside uh, Butts' new British cemetery, which is, in fact, a large concentration cemetery. They are, in fact, linked by a cross of sacrifice that links the two. And so you have, in, in almost one location, linked by one cross of sacrifice, that big cross with the sword on it. In fact, it's a, uh, known as a, a two-handed crusader sword that is emblazoned upon the cross of sacrifice um, it links these two very different cemeteries and very obviously different cemeteries because the burials in the in the battlefield cemetery ad hoc all over the place two men there three men there one man in that corner one man in the other corner um, and in fact the cemetery has to be or the design of the cemetery has to be designed around their burials whereas a, a concentration cemetery created after the war bringing men in from all over the battlefield very much I often use a little silly uh, catchphrase uh, symmetry in the cemetery um, because that's what they are most uh, concentration cemeteries are symmetrical uh, because they were physically designed to incorporate the bodies of the men gathered from off the battlefield so you can see that uh, that symmetry immediately so take us to the end of the war pete that's a great explanation of what was happening during the the conflict and so we get to the end of the war we're obviously victorious we must have looked at that devastation across the battlefields and just thought, what the hell are we going to do about all of this? What was the process? How long did it take? And, and what did they do during those years immediately after the First World War? Well, I think again, I'll, I'll go slightly back. And so the, the, the formation of the actual uh, Commonwealth War Graves, as we, we see as the Imperial War Graves, uh, took place uh, in the May of 1917. So it's actually earlier than we imagine. It's just that you cannot do a great deal while the war, the war is going on. But they all already start to think about design, think about concepts. Uh, and one of the things they want to ensure is that every man no matter what rank, no matter what religion, no matter what country from the Commonwealth they came from, that they would all be treated with the same care and would in fact be buried in the same style, same headstone effectively, effectively yes, the information that's relevant to, to that person that's buried there, but it would all feel the same. So effectively, you could in fact, very unusually if, it, if this did happen, but you could have a, a Lieutenant Colonel um, uh, uh, buried beside a, uh, a black South African labourer um, because in, in death they're all going to be treated the same so what we get is, uh, is is basically a manual a manual of what they're going to do how it's how this is going to work so I'm going to go back again a little a little first to discuss the, the cemeteries that are already on the battlefield so what we have um, are the battlefield cemeteries which we've already mentioned then we get the aid post cemeteries in other words it's a medical cemetery it's men that are being taken off the battlefield that are dying of uh, of their of their injuries, uh, and they will get no further than the aid post, the first uh, the first medical aid that they're going to get. 
following that route back of aid, then we would also get the field ambulance, the field hospital, and eventually the stationary hospital. And again, men being buried in all of those locations who, who sadly will not survive their, their wounding. So all of those, we get uh, fairly, uh, uh, fairly large in some cases, sometimes very small, but we get cemeteries. Uh, those in the main uh, exist because they all normally, unless something very odd happens, they will be over the, the forty, and so they're they're going to uh, they're going to uh, be in those locations. And then we get the concentration cemeteries, the large cemeteries. Now those are perhaps the most interesting because they're going to be dictated to by the number of people that are scattered in the paddocks around. So mainly the concentration cemeteries will be uh, on the battlefield or very close to where the battlefields were. Of course, this is after the war, so where the battlefields uh, were. And it's going to be the bringing of men into those uh, into those locations, and they are designed locations. Those cemeteries are going to be designed by some of the great and good, some of the the architects like Lutyens, who will design the Australian National Memorial. He's also designing a, a great number of uh, of cemeteries that uh, will contain the graves of of men gathered together and and taken in. So the key is. How do you decide where you're going to place them? Well, as you can imagine, it's because you're looking at the concentration of dead in those areas. So, in fact, the Commonwealth War Graves, one of the first jobs they have to do is to um, take the trench maps of the, of the period, stick them all together, grid them up, and start counting the visible dead. And make sure that I'm saying that, the visible dead. So these are men buried on the battlefield, marked with white crosses wherever they were, not always white, but in the main white, makes them stand out, crosses that, uh, that they can find on the battlefield, and they're going to count those and say, well, actually, they're all individuals, they can't remain where they are, those are all individuals, it's a very small cemetery there, so what we need to do is we need to plonk a cemetery in the middle of that lot, it's going to be a concentration cemetery, and we're going to bring these guys in and create this concentration of, of men from that area. And that was obvious. That was often quite uh, extreme, wasn't it? I think Huga Crater is an example. It had I can't remember the exact numbers, but there was something like seventy burials in a small cemetery, and there's now two or three thousand in that cemetery. Yeah, exactly. Now, now that's interesting. You see, because the, in that case, what you're getting is a, a, a dual cemetery, and that's quite common. The best example of that would be Tynecott. Tynecott Cemetery, largest Commonwealth uh, war grave cemetery in the world, uh, twelve thousand soldiers buried in there or thereabouts, it's rounding it. Uh, up, I think, slightly. Um, but there are about 12,000 men buried there. And uh, when they put a pin in the map and they said, right, we're going to make our concentration cemetery here, they said, oh, hang on a minute, there actually is a small cemetery there already. What do we do? What do we do with this small cemetery? Well, that becomes the nucleus of the concentration cemetery that spreads out around it. So, in fact, there it's actually the uh, the original little uh, uh, cemetery created just after the fighting left finally in 1918 is created in between the Cross of Sacrifice and the Stone of Remembrance, uh, two uh, very striking features in most cemeteries. And uh, the, they then built the big concentration cemetery around. So that tells you that it isn't always just a, a medical aid post. It may be a medical aid post that started as a battlefield cemetery, then became a medical aid, aid post, and then it became a, a concentration cemetery. So you can have all three within the same uh, the same uh, cemetery. So you just have to look carefully. But normally looking at them, you get the clue of what it is. The graves around the, the cross of sacrifice are higgledy-piggledy. They're all over, little groups of men. And then the graves around them are those lines that we expect to see. Uh, that this is our mental image of a Commonwealth War Grave Cemetery, straight lines running in every direction, perfectly aligned. I love that philosophy, Pete, of letting the cemetery tell you a story because you're absolutely right. When you go and visit these cemeteries, when you walk around, you can see the story of what went on around them, even just by the layout of some of the graves, can't you? Yeah, you can. I mean, you can learn an awful lot. I'm going to use a little almost ridiculous example, and this is to do with that, that number of, uh, of 40 men. Uh, there's a cemetery on the far side of Amiens. Sadly, can't remember the name of it, but it doesn't matter. Um, and uh, myself and a colleague one day were wandering around this cemetery, and it's, it was obviously an evacuation cemetery, medical evacuation cemetery. But in amongst the, uh, the people who were dying there of, of their wounds were a lot of people who had been killed in action. And I thought, this is ridiculous. How are men being buried here who are killed in action, must be nearly 25 kilometres away? What are they doing buried, buried 
buried here. Has something very strange happened? Did the war maybe get here? And I'm, I'm unaware of it. No, that's not the answer. The answer is that the men that were brought in that were killed in action were, were exactly that. They were brought in from the battlefield in the closure of small uh, battlefield cemetery, brought over 25 kilometers to be put into this. So the next question is, why would you do that? Why would you move men such a distance to put them into, uh, into this cemetery? And the answer is, when we counted up the original people that were buried there, less than 40. Somebody wanted that cemetery to remain. We will never probably know why, but somebody said, I want this cemetery to actually remain. It's less than 40 people. The only way to ensure it remains is to ensure there's more than 40 people buried in here. It can then become a permanent cemetery. So in that case, they brought them in from the battlefield. In the clearance of the battlefield of individual graves and small groupings, they brought them uh, this distance, 25 kilometers or more, and, and buried them. So you get some very oddities sometimes. But, but if you look carefully, you can work it out. It takes some time sometimes to figure it out why, why it looks like it does. Um, but the, that's one of the reasons uh, or what, what one thing you can spot on the cemeteries. Absolutely extraordinary. I've seen several examples of even individual soldiers moved crazy distances from where they were killed or where they were originally buried to the cemetery where they now lie. And and as you say, there's there's no explanation. There's no answer as to why that occurred. We'll probably never know the reasons that uh, that, that people moved around. I have an idea now. It took a long time. Again, I, I used to say exactly what you said, but I thought it must be simpler than that. So you need to, uh, thankfully, the Commonwealth War Graves always releasing a little bit more information. One of the things that they've started releasing for men that were moved is uh, the exhumation reports, which actually give you a little bit of insight as to where they came from. Very often they have a map reference. It's an old military map reference. Um, through various sites now, you can convert that military map reference to a, a Google Earth photograph, and a pin drops in that Google Earth photograph, and there is where the original grave was. Quite often you can see as well that these are isolated graves or just very small groupings of graves. So what means, what, what process takes place then to have a man move 30 kilometres or more? It's purely logistics. It, it, it is the grave diggers and the exhumation teams are not working together. So an exhumation team working at one side of the battlefield exhumes a couple of bodies. And of course, if they've got to them as quickly as they possibly can, they've got to get them back into the ground. And so what they do is they put out the shout. Where are the grave diggers working? Where do we have pre-prepared graves waiting for, and these will be in the concentration cemeteries, waiting for bodies? And that's where they go. They will then go to the nearest uh, cemetery where the grave diggers are working. So it's simple logistics about the movement of bodies from one side of the battlefield to the other. But you're absolutely right. The ridiculous distances. And sometimes you're thinking, well, in between there and there, there are three other concentration cemeteries. Why are they not in one of those? It's because the grave diggers were not working in those. On the day that his body was recovered, they're not working there. They're working over there, and over there he goes. That's great information, Pete. That actually makes a lot of sense and solves a few mysteries for me, even just in my head right now. Mate, you mentioned the grave exhumation units. I mean, what a job that must have been. Talk to me a little bit about who were these people, what was their task? And what, I mean, that must have been the most gruesome job on the battlefield. Yeah, it's a, it's a, I find it fascinating. As you can probably, probably realize uh, the, the, the burials and the exhumations and the movement of bodies I find uh, uh, are just very, very interesting. Uh, and, and yes, I asked that very same question many years ago. Who are the guys that are doing this? When you look at the pictures of them, there are pictures of them. There are a, a couple uh, or a, a good handful of photos that were taken officially by the uh, Commonwealth War Graves as they were actually uh, doing this. They wanted to keep a certain record of, of what they were doing. And you look at the guys' faces of the men that are involved in the exhumations. They're all old, uh, first of all. Or they all, all appear to be old. Uh, war does age you. But they all appear to be older men, men that are perhaps used to seeing death, uh, used to having to uh, having to deal with, uh, with with burials, perhaps in their actual military career, because this is going on after the, after the, the, the fighting. Um, they're all volunteers as well. Uh, so it wasn't something that you were in the main that you were conscripted into. Uh, the exhumation teams are volunteers. So these are guys that know what they're getting into. In some cases, I would have to suspect these are guys that don't particularly want to go home because for whatever reason, because this is going on into 1919, into 1920. Um, so there may be an element of that. that uh, so you get the impression perhaps some of them may be a little traumatized. They may, may have what we don't know as PTSD. They don't feel that they want to go home and they feel that they want to do something perhaps that they may view to uh, maybe atone for things that they've done in the war or perhaps just just to try and get 
things out of their system. Uh, I'm actually doing great leaps of uh, of guesswork here, but it is it's just just interesting. And looking at their faces, you can see some of these guys. They just you know, look like they, they're, they're perhaps in the wrong job, but I think that it's a job that they feel that they, they they have to do. Also, we can now see from military records that are now uh, open and available that they did have problems with drunkenness uh, in some of the exhumation teams, and they did have problems uh, with thievery, so the loss of, uh, of of rings and things off bodies. Because remember, a lot of these guys died with all their belongings. They were not recovered until after the war by one of these exhumation teams. And so there were opportunities for those that were... were uh, of, of of that disposition so we know that that not everything is always as it seems and in fact uh, the commonwealth war graves had a, a rather um a difficult situation to deal with just here in albert fairly recently within the last three years uh, the remains of three soldiers were found who were all identified uh, near uh, uh, lot nagar in an area called the glory hole those three soldiers who were recovered uh, actually already had graves so obviously something very strange had gone on for three men to be given graves in the local cemetery at the time in the 1920s, but but then to be found uh, four years ago. Um, and uh, suspicion is possibly a, a rogue exhumation team that wasn't actually quite doing what it was supposed to be doing. Um, and uh, uh, that's the only thing you can really think uh, that, that, that could be the reason for that. So we know that things are not always quite as they were, but I think that the uh, the exhumation teams very often did uh, fairly hideous work, and you can perhaps uh, I can certainly excuse the drunkenness. That's uh, that, that's for, that's for sure. It's the exact opposite for the grave diggers. The grave diggers uh, were actually uh, ordered to do it. It was a it was a job. And very often they picked the young men, uh, the very fit men, and sometimes the men that hadn't seen combat because they'd arrived to, uh, too late. And in the war memorial, there's a very, very good uh, uh, first-hand account of a man, a uh, young man, 18, uh, arrives uh, in France in 1918. Um, and it's just gone uh, November the, the 11th. I think he arrived on something like the, uh, the 18th of, uh, of November uh, in France. The, the war's finished. And what did they do? They gave him a shovel and they said, right, off you go, you can go and dig graves. And instead of being horrified and, uh, and, and thinking, oh, you know, he kept a diary. And the diary very clearly uh, shows you that he, he comments, he actually says that uh, um, I'm sad that I didn't get here to do my bit, uh, to, to fight. The next best thing I can do is to ensure that those that did uh, fight and died have a proper burial. And he's an absolutely diligent grave digger who even had his photo taken a few times standing behind Sergeant Major so-and-so so -so of the so-and-so regiment, MMDCM, a very brave man. I buried him today and there he is standing behind with his hands on his spade. Uh, and this is uh, uh, actually at Villas Breton at the National uh, Australian National Memorial. It's the cemetery there that uh, that he's working. So uh, fascinating little little by the by. But the, the, the difference between the two types of people, the exhumation team and the grave digger, very often very different types of people. The exhumation teams did some pretty impressive work when you think about the task that was in front of them at the end of the war um, and their ability to find, because you mentioned the graves that were marked, those were the easy ones, weren't they? Because the battlefield, particularly in places like Belgium and the Ypres salient, the battlefield was absolutely covered in buried and unburied corpses, effectively, without getting too gruesome. We shouldn't sugarcoat it. This is what the battlefield looks like after the fighting has stopped. There were graves, there were marked graves, there were unmarked graves, there were bits of bodies lying on battlefields, there were decayed corpses just lying out in the open. How did they possibly bring all that together and, 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 and impose some sense of order on that chaos? Yeah, I think it was very difficult, uh, and I, I have to say I'm not always sure that they that, that they did. Um, again, we can get into some of the records now. Uh, some of the records are open at the Commonwealth War Graves, and they, they they make it clear that there was difficulties. They had they had a lot of difficulties in in actually identifying people who they were desperately trying to identify. And you, and you have to say there's a reason for it. You know, questions were being asked in the parliaments around around the uh, the empire as it was as to how many you know, how would we lost so many men? How why were all of these men? And they're missing um, and certainly as those questions were being asked by people who had not experienced or not seen or, or not been involved in, in the battlefields here so it, it makes it very difficult uh, when when there's a definite pressure and you can feel it there was a definite pressure to identify as many men as, as, as possible 
Uh, and that's why we get sometimes the terms believed to be or known to be buried near to this location. There are variations of a, of a theme that show that the, the men are not always directly below the marker. They're, they're somewhere else close, uh, but that's the best, they, uh, the best they can do. So yeah, we do get uh, variations. In fact, this, this area that I live in uh, around the village of Flair is a good example. The winter of 19, 16, 17, appalling. Um, I go through whole battalion attacks when I look at the records of the battalions as these are Australian battalions fighting in this area, especially the 5th of no- November when a big attack went in around here. And there's, nobody's got a grave. Nobody that was killed on, on the 5th of November. I'd, it's, it's almost really difficult to find anybody that's got a grave who, who died on the battlefield on the 5th of November. The conditions were so appalling that they either were not buried at all or they were buried and, and marked very, very uh, rudimentary. I actually came across, a. I thought oh, I found a grouping of, of men, um, and this was looking at the Commonwealth Organs records, and it stated that these men had, uh, 20 men, had been uh, buried under a single cross. After the war, they exhumed beneath the single cross. Nobody. Couldn't find anybody. Uh, obviously, the cross had been blown over at some stage, put back up again, wasn't in the right spot. So even these 20 men, one of the very few who actually had a, a marker on this battlefield, they were not beneath the cross. So what do you do? Well, in this case, in this case the Commonwealth War Games did something rather, I think, rather strange in some ways. They uh, moved the marker, the cross, into a local cemetery, um, one of the concentration cemeteries, and eventually put up uh, headstones to these uh, 20 men um, and with a, an obelisk, a little obelisk, that, that tells you that they are not here, that uh, on concentration they could not be found. But because they had a marker, it felt unfair that they didn't now have a, a headstone. Um, well, to my view, to a certain extent, it's cheating because they are still on the battlefield. They are close to where they fell, close to where they were originally buried together. They are still together. And uh, Germans tend to call them comrades grave, the term which I uh, uh, prefer to use as well. So these little comrades graves, and, and in this case, it's still there wherever it, 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 it was. It, it wasn't where it was marked and it still is there on the battlefield. But they, they felt that because they had a marker that they would actually notionally uh, give them headstones. So they actually have headstones, but their bodies are not there. They're, they're on the battlefield. So they did start looking at ways to try and reduce the numbers of, of, the, of the missing. And you're absolutely right. The, uh, uh, the states of, of some, especially the woods around here, again, I'm going to talk about around where I live, uh, Flair, the woods around here, the fighting in Highwood and Delvillewood had been just appalling. And with a combination of smashed timber and fighting over it again and over it again, you know, they became very difficult places to, to clear because you were picking up, again, you know, there's no way of avoiding it. They were picking up fragments of people and wondering what do we do when we've only got fragments of people. Um, it's still a question that is uh, is relevant today. They find the fragments of people, just the bones, of course, but they find bones of people in the plow lines. What do you do with the bones of people found nowadays in the plow lines? Well, actually, nothing. They don't do anything. The Commonwealth War Graves will not collect a, a, a femur or a, or a few finger bones or a few toe bones. Um, and they remain uh, on, on the battlefield. And I think they must have had similar problems uh, in the clearance. What do you do with the fragments of, uh, of human remains that you have no hope of, uh, of identifying? The French got round it by creating ossuaries. Uh, we, did, we, we have never created ossuaries, but the French create ossuaries and the fragmentary bones went into the ossuaries across the big one at, at um, uh, Dumont in, uh, uh, on the, uh, the Vedun battlefield. Pete, talk to us a little bit about uh, the concept of missing soldiers at this stage. I mean, we're jumping all over the place here, but it's the sort of conversation that lends itself to that because it's just such a big conceptual idea, the, the cemeteries of why they were built, etc. Just just explain for us a little bit the difference between when we say these soldiers are missing, and so we, we're talking here about the big memorials that have literally tens of thousands of names on them. Talk to me about the difference between a missing soldier and someone with no known grave. Because when we, we tend to say the word missing, which implies that the soldiers on the memorials are still out in the field, but for most of them that's not the case, isn't it? No, no, it's not. So it's, uh, again, uh, the realisation that uh, as a very young man when I started becoming interested in this was that I, I presumed missing, as most of uh, the people I take around the battlefields uh, would also believe. Uh, missing to me, uh, uh, when I was a young man, and to, and to them, means hit by an artillery shell, blown to smithereens, and you're missing because because you're gone. And I, I honestly think my father thought that as well uh, in, in my early conversations with him about my grandfather who actually survived the war. 
but uh, we have a, a great uncle who, who was missing. Uh, my dad's comment was, oh, nobody knows what happened to him. He'd have been blown to bits. Well, almost certainly he was not blown to bits. Almost certainly, for whatever reason, and there are multiple reasons, and I'll cover a couple of them in a, in, in a minute, he's he's probably got a, mar uh, a marked grave as an unknown soldier. Uh, in some cases, you get much more than that. You will get uh, an unknown sergeant of the 51st Battalion, uh, and that tells you something. It tells you that the, uh, the Commonwealth War Graves of the... Uh, 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 the grave registration units at the time um, were putting as much information together when they buried a man as they put, as, uh, as, as they possibly could, and that information uh, remained. Of course, that information that they had uh, is sometimes we have more nowadays, which means that some of that rudimentary information, just the uh, sergeants of the 51st Battalion buried buried here, we now sometimes have a hope of actually physically identifying him. Of course, we're not allowed to touch the uh, the soldiers who were buried by the uh, by the war graves. They are sacrosanct. You and you cannot exhume them or, or take DNA. Of course, something that many people ask me: Well, why do we not take DNA of these guys? Surely we can identify them. Almost certainly, uh, you could uh, for for many of them, but they're not going to do that but actually uh, there are various groups uh, around the world in, in fact uh, the one that's uh, probably more prominent in Australia is the Fallen uh, uh, Diggers and um, uh, and they uh, they actually try and identify a, a, a soldier who is in uh, unknown marked as an unknown Australian um, by paperwork documentation and quite often now with the computerization of records and, and cross indexing etc etc we can now put a good case together to present to the Commonwealth Warriors and say we believe we know who this man is and I think their hit rate is something like four a year they're managing to identify by documentation but back to your original question Matt about uh, about being unknown yeah it's a concept that really starts um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the missing to start off with um, the missing the concept of becoming missing is also sometimes uh, uh, difficult to understand how do you become missing well simply the, the simple term for missing means that you are not there at the roll call when the battalion at the end of an action probably the following day holds a roll call of those men that uh, uh, went into the attack um, you will become missing uh, not if you're you may become uh, they'll know you're dead they may not know where your body is but effectively, if nobody answers the roll call and then none of his mates say, oh, yeah, I know I'm to Jimmy, he had his head shot off at so and so. Uh, no. So, yes, he may be missing physically, but they know, he, know he's dead. The difficulty becomes with these men that nobody answers, nobody knows what happens uh, to them, and they are just marked down as, uh, as missing. That then becomes a, 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 a problematic. Um, for many reasons, and one of the most important reasons is, of course, that the, the wives and mothers of these men uh, will not receive a pension uh, so long as they r remain missing. Also, their pay stops whilst they're missing. So there are actually there are problems uh, back at home for, for the next of kin of these soldiers who are marked down as missing. So again, something had to be done to, to speed up that, uh, that process of being declared dead, missing and then dead. Uh, and that's, uh, that was, again, taken on by the Red Cross because they can operate behind German lines uh, through uh, Switzerland. And so they can ask questions and receive answers from the German military as to whether they're burying uh, men uh, uh, who are being killed in action and, he and held by them or men that are dying of, of wounds in the German medical evacuation system. So that uh, solved uh, uh, one of the problems in, uh, in identifying men that were missing. The other way that they could actually track down men who were uh, who had become missing was to ask their friends who may not have been at the roll call of the end of the action, but they may uh, be in hospitals all over the, uh, the UK or elsewhere and track them down and say, you, know, you were not at the roll call, but uh, you were serving in the same company. Do you know what happened to? And of course, very often they do. And we can actually look at those files uh, in the Red Cross Missing Inquiry uh, Bureau files, which are on online. Uh, so that uh, this is Australian, uh, I should say. Um, uh, so that also so uh, helps as well. But yes, the, 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 the big question is going to be for those that remain missing, for those that uh, do not have a named grave and may have a grave, what are you going to do? What are you going to do to compensate those families who do not have a, um, a place to commemorate their relative, i.e. a grave? And now for Australians, it's difficult anyway because of different uh, distance to actually get to those, uh, uh, to, to those graves. Um, but of course, for, for most Brits, who are, it's only a couple of hours across the, uh, across the channel, they came in, in, well, eventually tens of thousands. They came to visit their missing relatives. 
Um, but frustrating is a little bit more uh, more difficult. Uh, but you know, something has to be done. Something has to be done for the people that have not got a grave to visit. And so it was decided as they're thinking of building the big memorials, I know we're going to build a memorial. So let's use, use the Australian National Memorial at Villas Bretano as a really good example, because it is a good example. Um, let's build a, a very big memorial commemorate by the, the best architect the empire had at the at that time Lutyens. let's build a big memorial uh, commemorating uh, australian service on the western front and let's also put on the names of the missing of france and it's a, it's a compensation no it's we haven't uh, he hasn't got a grave we don't know or, or he may have a grave but we don't know where it is um but look what we've put his name on we've put his name on this very large memorial to compensate for for your loss and and for the fact that uh, uh, we no longer know where he's where he's uh, he's buried it's a it's a really important point to make that when you see those big memorials that the majority of those men actually do have a grave. Only the slight majority. I think it's almost 50-50. But, the, but the, the majority of the men on those memorials do have a grave. It's just that we don't know which man is in which grave. So for every cemetery you visit, there will be graves that say an unknown soldier. That grave corresponds to a name on the memorial. We just have absolutely no ability to marry up which name belongs to which grave. No, I, I'm going to just uh, tell you a, just a, a very uh, unusual story that, that shows just occasionally you can actually, in, in identifying an unknown soldier's grave, you can get as near as you possibly can to, uh, 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 to it being the, uh, the, the man that they're looking for. And this was purely accidental. I was with an Australian family who wished to visit a cemetery that was the closest one to where their relative had been killed. Um, and their request was, Pete, could you find us an unknown soldier of his battalion? And we will notionally make that uh, our relative's grave. Of course, the expectation would be that it's it's not going to be uh, their relative's grave. But yes, I succeeded in doing that prior to uh, taking them onto the battlefield. And I took them to this cemetery and we're staring at this grave and we're putting, and it's a, an unknown soldier of, I can't remember, let's say the 21st battalion. And uh, uh, the, the, the chap that I'm taking there, he put his arm around me and he said, Pete, you haven't looked at the grave next to him, have you? And I said, no, I haven't. And so the body buried beside this unknown soldier of the 21st Battalion was a known soldier of the 21st Battalion. Died on the correct day, the same day that we were looking for, and he had a consecutive number to their relative. And so it was just mind-boggling, really, because if you'd picked a grave and said, this is the one that is the most likeliest anywhere on the Western Front to be your, to be your relative, then that would be it. And for those that, that uh, are unaware, Australian battalion numbers are, are numbering consecutively. So in other words, if you're in the queue and the guy in front of you uh, joins up before you, he will have the number before uh, the one that you will have. Um, and so this guy would be a guy that was in the queue next to the, the the soldier that they were commemorating who had no known grave. So you could not get closer to a uh, to the to a potential uh, uh, burial site. So yeah, just one of those quirks of fate, really. What a wonderful story! That's what I love about walking the battlefields and visiting these cemeteries. And you know, I've heard the cemeteries referred to as silent cities, and that's really what they are. They're like communities in their own rights, and every headstone tells an interesting story. And I say to people all the time, whenever you go to a military cemetery, just spend a few minutes wandering the rows and look for interesting inscriptions or interesting ranks it's incredible some of the things that come out often they're little mysteries that you can't solve until perhaps you get home and get in front of your computer but it's incredible the little strange little stories that come out why was this guy the you know the only the only guy from this country buried in this cemetery or uh, you know uh, such a high rank but he's buried right at the front line or you know there's there's so many little mysteries that uh, that are wonderful to to dig in and try and solve there's, there's some extraordinary. I have to say, I've got a, a camera that's absolutely full of photographs of exactly that. I'll take a photograph of this, and I must research it. It's just finding the time when you I do, do it exactly so often. I do exactly the same. I do exactly the same. I've got thousands of photos of random graves. Yeah, there are just. Uh, and sometimes I look and I think, why did I photograph that? There must have been something. And sometimes when you're not in the cemetery and it's not contextual with the other graves around, you can't actually remember what why it was that you thought I must photograph that because I need to look into that to find out why he's there. I have to say another just little odd story. And this is, I have to say, I'm making a massive guess here, but uh, we're, go, we're going now into Belgium to a cemetery called Listenhoek Cemetery. And uh, just as the, uh, on the exit, as you're leaving, uh, Listenhoek Cemetery, again, for those that don't know, Listenhoek is a, uh, a cemetery that was created in a field 
uh, ambulance evacuation center. It's a very big cemetery. But there they had a little bit of time and they did tend to um, we have to remember that at this stage, the Commonwealth War Games hadn't been formed. So the, this uh, this idea that everybody will be the same and buried together and intermingled didn't exist uh, at the time that this cemetery started. So the officers tend to be buried separately. So you get several rows of, uh, of officers. And I remember looking at this chap. He's he's separate from everybody else. He's an officer. And there's a gap in between him and everybody else. And for years, I, I tried looking him up and trying to find out why he would be buried. And I was working on the, the assumption that he's something better, that he comes from a better family. His family wanted a gap between him and the nearest other officer. And in the end, I just staring at his grave and I thought, I think I know what it is. And it just it, it clicked. No Christian symbol on his headstone. And now to be an officer at this period, uh, not to be a Christian would be seen as very, very odd. Um, and so I think the gap in between him and the nearest man is because he wasn't a Christian. Um, uh, and that's the only thing I can think of. And I've not been able to find anything else. But once you know that, it's very obvious. This row that goes on for forever, they've all got Christian crosses on their headstone. He has not. So I think that's the reason why there's a gap in between him and his, uh, his, uh, his colleagues. Well, talking about uh, Lesson Hoax Cemetery is probably a really good segue into the the transition from those uh, pretty rough and ready wooden crossed cemeteries at the end of the war and the absolutely magnificent, tended, gorgeous cemeteries that we see today. And you can't overstate this. To anyone who has not been to a Commonwealth War Grave Cemetery on the Western Front, when you do, you will be absolutely blown away by the beauty of the place, the, the 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 way it's maintained, the gardens, the flowers, they're absolutely incredible. So, Pete, I'm really interested in not just what was done but the philosophy behind it. When they made these decisions to build these permanent cemeteries, as we call them, what were they thinking? What were they trying to do? And, and what did they actually carry out in the construction of these cemeteries? Yeah, well, I, I think, again, the uh, the thought process started uh, even probably even before 1917, uh, when some of the uh, the great and good of, of the nation were, were really trying to get their heads around what was going to happen at the end. And we start to get the, the, the start of ideas that these things, perhaps these cemeteries, perhaps need a bit of a design input, to, uh, to say the least. So I think that's that's the starting point is that the, there needed to be a um, a. Uh, an element of, of design uh, uh, into them. There, again, I've already mentioned it, but the the belief was that uh, no matter what rank, what colour, what uh, what creed, that you would all have exactly the same uh, headstone. It was decided that the headstone would be made out of Jurassic limestone. I mean, that has actually just changed recently. Jurassic limestone is um, needs to be recut. It weathers quite badly um, within a hundred years. Most most of the Jurassic limestone headstones will have been cut recut at least once. So we're now going over to marble also jurassic limestone is, is getting a, bit, a little rare so we're now going over to marble headstones uh, for the purists they don't like it but i think from a sensible point of view it's a it's a great idea because the, the, you will not be recutting those for centuries the, the, they're there for for good um and again uh, the largest commonwealth war graves uh, cemetery uh, at tynecott is is possibly has more uh, of the marble headstones than any, any other they've made that one almost uh, the, the first I think that will become the first uh, cemetery that's completely uh, marble um, so that's that's what they're, they're, they're hoping to achieve but there's a lot more there's a lot more going on um, but what you can always uh, see is that they decided that each cemetery would be designed individually because again I get people saying are they not all supposed to be facing the cross of sacrifice this big cross with the sword emblazoned on it are they not also be facing that because sometimes they face it sometimes they're facing away from it sometimes the cross of sacrifice is at one end sometimes it's right in the middle so no that design concept was the architect that designs that cemetery so I think almost that was deliberate is that there will not be one central design they will not all look exactly the same they will have the same elements cross of sacrifice stone of remembrance which looks a little bit like an altar i mean that's in fact that's what it's supposed to represent not a tomb some people think that it represents a tomb but it's 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 not it's uh, it actually is a an altar um so they will have that design kind of uh, uh, concept the headstones will all uh, look the same 
But in fact, the, sometimes there are hedges around, sometimes there are stone walls around, sometimes there are brick walls around. So that varies, and that is down to the architect. Even the gates, you'll find that every gate is different. The gates that lead you into the cemetery, they're, they're, all, they're, all, they're all different. Don't, but when you don't get, get me started there, on that one, Pete, because I um, I only half-jokingly <laughs> have said I'm get, my next book will be called Gate Latches on the Western Front because one, yeah, of, the, one exactly. of the small delights of visiting the battlefields is when you go into yeah. a cemetery, and they all have a, a fairly large, usually a fairly large, heavy iron gate, when you go in, the manner of fastenings that control those gates is the most extraordinary collection of engineering and art that you will ever see in your life. And I suspect the architects had wonderful drunken soirees together where they sat around saying, well, what if we had a little a little tumbler that then connected to a ball and chain which looped back the other one? They're just extraordinary. So look out for that book in coming years, Gate Latches on the Western Front. Yeah, they are, they are very, very different. And it is extraordinary. It is. It's like a test every time you walk to a new cemetery. How is this one going to work? Um, I've actually actually had a gate that was actually taken off uh, and and weighed those gates. Those gates, they're, they're, they are architectural masterpieces in their, their own right. They weigh a ton. They are, they are um, uh, they're, uh, raw iron. They're just un- unbelievably heavy. So, yeah, everything was made to last, that's for sure, when they were designing these cemeteries. Um, I think the most, most obvious thing for those that have certainly visited a Commonwealth War Grave Cemetery, anywhere in the world in the summer when the, when the flowers are in bloom, is that they are beautiful. They are, they are the most, and it is almost a juxtaposition with the horror that was once there, certainly with the battlefield cemeteries, the medical cemeteries. Um, you know, you feel that the horror that was once in these areas, and now we have this, this extreme beauty. Uh, and they do say that they were designed to have the feel of an English cottage garden. Um, because the flowering are, are fantastic. And when you've uh, visited other battlefields and certainly other nations' uh, cemeteries, you realise that it is unusual. And nearly everybody else that created cemeteries, that they're lawned, and perhaps the best examples are the American cemeteries, uh, 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 Omaha Beach, the, the cemetery there at Colville being a really good example. Perfect, neat, straight rows of white crosses, but in lawns, just lawns, no flowers, no anything, just a lawn, a perfectly, you have to say, a perfectly manicured lawn, but it is just a lawn, and the French cemeteries are the same. It's only the uh, the British Commonwealth War Graves uh, cemeteries um, that that are uh, that are, that are beautiful in a sense of you get that feel of being in in a in a garden. And I have to say, you know, my great joys of living here on the Somme battlefield is uh, I have a little motorbike, and I very often hop onto my motorbike with my flask of coffee whistle out around the battlefield trying to find a cemetery i've not visited getting a little difficult at the moment uh, I, I am nearly running out of uh, I, I haven't mentioned how many well, there are 960 commonwealth war grave cemeteries in northern france and belgium so it is an enormous number to visit if you were kind of on an expedition to visit every cemetery 960 cemeteries um and every one with a slightly different feel and a different size and different setting um, so it is a, it's a fantastic, uh, these are fantastic places to visit. And that was the whole idea that when you went to them, you would feel at peace. And, and I do, I always uh, go and sit down quietly with the chaps, uh, have a, have a flask of coffee. And as you mentioned earlier, uh, Matt, go around and try and find that anomaly. I wonder why he's buried in here. He shouldn't be here. That's not the right date. Um, and so, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, they, they are places that I think, I think what they set out to do. Uh, still works today. You you do get a, a, a feeling of peace, a feeling that these guys are are not forgotten. And one of the interesting aspects for those that, that have been to a cemetery will know that on mo- the majority, only the very small ones, do not have a little brass door in the corner. And you open that brass door and you'll find two things in there. You will find a visitor's uh, book that you can sign and you will find a register which basically it tells you who is in that cemetery. And how to find them. It's the larger cemetery. It is a, a sometimes a daunting task. You walk into a large cemetery and think, oh, I don't, actually, I know he's in here, but I don't know where. I don't understand the system. I don't understand that in the uh, uh, in the visit, in the register there will be a, a map uh, and also an alphabetical index so it helps you to find them. If you don't know that and you start walking up the the rows of some of the larger ones, you can be there all day. But why is there a visitor's book to sign? You get the most moving comments in there. 
But it's the one thing that the Commonwealth War Graves keeps a check on, is how many people are visiting the cemeteries. They're interested, uh, for a very good reason. You know, they put enormous effort. There's a big cost element here. Now, I'm not saying they're going to start shutting them down if, uh, if not enough people go. But it is just interesting to see how many people uh, visit the cemeteries on the Western Front. And I have to say, uh, not all of them are visited uh, very often at all, and uh, a very little one on the Arras battlefield that I once visited. I could see on the top of a hill, but I could not figure out how to get to it. It took me, it took me a couple of trips before I fan, finally found the cart track that took me up to this cemetery. And I went there and I had a look around, very small, just over the 40. Um, I opened the visitor's book, I signed it, and I noted that the, the guy that had signed before was the inspecting officer from the Commonwealth War Graves. I went there a year later, and in between my signature uh, and me visiting again was the inspecting officer from the Commonwealth War Graves. It was me again. Um, and I don't think, well, people may have been, but nobody had signed the visitor's book in between uh, my two visits. So uh, I think other people were probably experiencing the same, that uh, they could see it, but not quite sure how to get there. It's almost a little lost thrill from the from the battlefields. The, it, it doesn't really happen anymore because the numbers have increased so much of people visiting. But it used to be, when I was first going there 20 years ago, it used to be the case that quite often you would go to a tiny little out-of-the-way cemetery and open that visitor's book and find that you were the first visitor in many months or occasionally in many years. Um, and that's, uh, that's, that's kind of disappeared a little bit now on the battlefields but still can be fa- um, found in various cemeteries. But I think the important point you're making there, Pete, is to everyone listening to this who will be visiting a cemetery in the future, sign the visitor's book so that they know you've been there because it is important that the authorities know that people are still visiting these cemeteries. Yeah, it's one of the things I always say to my clients is, is ensure you sign the visitor's book um, because I think it's important. I think it's the only way that the Commonwealth War Games, they don't have spies watching you to see how many people are going in. So it's the only way they, they get an idea of, of, of if people are going at all. Other than that, they have no idea. Yes, okay, sometimes when the gardens are working, um, and we'll perhaps have a chat about the gardening teams in a little while, the, uh, the, when the gardens are working, and I'm, I'm sure they see you, but they're not even going to report back and say, oh, we saw 50 people today. No, so the, the only way they have any idea is by of how many people are going is by looking at the uh, at the visitors book and you're, you're absolutely right the numbers have increased uh, in, in recent years certainly in the years of the centenary um, we've had a, a lot more people uh, out here and I think that's my worry is and I always uh, when I talk about the cemeteries one of the things I say you know the worst the worst thing that could possibly happen here on the on the old battlefields of the first world war is that nobody came no, nobody was visiting. And then I would really feel sad that they had really been forgotten. And uh, there was a period in the 1960s, perhaps early 70s, when certainly the First World War battlefields had become a backwater. We've had the Second World War, and those people who were uh, interested in warfare tended to go down to Normandy. Uh, and the First World battlefields were really becoming a backwater. And there was a worry that the Commonwealth War Games really would start thinking of that uh, perhaps this was not necessary. Perhaps all of these cemeteries were really overkill, and perhaps we ought to start thinking of doing it in the American way and concentrating into a couple of big cemeteries. But thank, thankfully, things changed in the 70s and uh, and, it, and it's never looked back since. Um, you know, there is a, an ongoing stream of people visiting the, the First World War uh, cemeteries because it is odd, you know, in a way. There's, there are very little battlefields to see. You know, I live in a, a centre of an enormous battlefield. Uh, but uh, are there any, you know, is there any trenches to go and look at here? Well, yes, just a little bit at, at Beaumont Hamel for those that have been onto the Somme. But there's not a lot to physically look at. And so the remaining, the, re, the, the, the remains of the battlefields are the memorials and the cemeteries. They are what people come to look at in lieu of being able to see a, a battlefield because there aren't any battlefields, thankfully, I have to say. You know, these, these men fought and died to ensure that this landscape went back into a, the, what it had been, a farming landscape. So, so yeah, I'm, I'm very pleased. This is not a, 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 a big preserved battlefield. It's, it's what the men fought and died for to ensure that the French farmers could do what they wanted, which is farm. Um, so, yes, the, the little cemetery is sitting amongst the fields that the men died fighting over so that, so that they could, this could continue. Pete, at this point, it's probably worth saying um, that the, we should remember whenever we visit a cemetery that it wasn't designed for us. It's, it's, it's easy to walk into a cemetery and think that it's like a memorial to a battle, you know, that it's a it's a monument that was placed there to record that a historic event occurred. And it does fulfil that purpose. And obviously 100 years later, it definitely fulfils that purpose. But I think it's always important, and I remind people of this when they visit the cemeteries, these cemeteries were not built for us. These cemeteries were built for the families, weren't they, of the people coming over. I mean, I know there was a nod to posterity. I know they're always were thinking these cemeteries will be here long after we're all gone. But the reason there were cemeteries and the elements that they built into those cemeteries were designed around the fact that many tens of thousands of pilgrims came over from England 
to come and visit those cemeteries, didn't they? Yeah, absolutely. It's actually one of the things that I often talk about is is the practicalities of the cemeteries. You know, people go into the cemeteries. Yes, there's headstones. Yes, the, the obviously the graves are there. Sometimes there are uh, memorials, but but uh, the, the walls around them, the entrance gate. But what's that building in the corner? Well, that building in the corner, which looks a little like a bus shelter, is in fact a bus shelter in a way. It's a, it's the practicalities. What do you do when you can visit this cemetery and you've just walked from the railway station, which was twenty minutes away, and you you're on a, a pouring down day. You're coming to see your son or your or your uh, uh, your rel- relative, your husband, because as you quite rightly said, Matt, these were originally designed thinking about the relatives and what what relatives and what people would need who wanted to visit these cemeteries. Well, one of the things they need is, is shelter. So, uh, so very often the buildings that you see that look beautiful uh, and are part and incorporated into the overall design, but it is a practicality. It's a place to go and shake your brolly out. It's a place to go and uh, ring, ring your Mac out or, or whatever, um, or to get out the sun even in, so, in some cases, so that there are practicalities. The other building that you often see, another little building within the cemetery is Again, sadly, no longer used. Well, sadly, it doesn't really make any difference, but it's the, it's the shed. It's the gardener's shed. All of these cemeteries at one time had their own allocated gardener or groups of gardeners. Well, where do you put your tools? You don't want to be taking them home every night. So there's a little shed in the corner, often a very a very beautiful oak door, stone built. Sometimes it looks a little bit like a hobbit house because they could be quite low. Well, that's what they're for. So you can wheel your wheelbarrow in at the end of the day with your tools in it that you've been your gardening tools, your, your pruning shears, and uh, off you go home. And the next day you, t- you turn up and you start again. Nowadays, they are mobile teams that are uh, actually operating out of vehicles. So they're no longer used. But it's just a nice, you know, I like kind of like going back a few uh, few years and imagining what it was like when the gardener kind of almost lived there. You know, he's the guy that, uh, that, that worked there and... Uh, very often these guys, and so I'm going off on a tangent again, very often these guys were ex-British military First World War veterans who decided that they were going to stay. Um, and uh, quite often it's because they've married a French woman or a Belgian uh, lady, and uh, and so they're staying in France and they're then looking for a job. And, oh, I don't know what I could get a job as. I'll, I'll, I'd like to be a gardener in one of the cemeteries. And so that, that, that is very often why they're here. So, yeah, the gardening teams uh, are quite often, uh, even the modern gardening teams, there is a tradition of, uh, of uh, father uh, passing the job down to son. So you quite often get men who are still gardeners here. And it's their, their grandfather, great-grandfather, who was a, a British veteran of the First World War who stayed and uh, married a French or Belgian lady had a family and that family is still here and uh, and they are still gardeners so there is a connection sometimes right the way back to uh, to the 1920s i've heard a story and it may or may not be true that um at Sayre road number two cemetery the big one of the big cemeteries on the somme that during the second world war that they used to use the little garden shed uh, the commonwealth Grey workers would use the little garden shed to um to house downed airmen who were shot down in the region i don't i don't know if that's true or not but i I love the imagery of uh, of the gardeners continuing to maintain the cemeteries during the Second World War, during German occupation, still maintaining the First World War cemeteries, um, and sheltering downed airmen who uh, you know doing their bit to help the Allied cause. It's it's one of the stories that I used to tell, but I've never really found a good reference to it. So uh, so I think it's probably true, uh, but uh, I've I've tried I try now not to kind of tell the stories that I'm not quite sure if they're really true or not. Well, they were hardly going to be keeping accurate records, were they? Rescued seven no, downed airmen today and passed them on to the resistance was, was yeah. a document that would get you in trouble with the authorities. So. <laughs> it would, uh, yeah, exactly. I certainly hope it's true. I hope that one's true. Yeah, I do. I do as well. And interestingly, one of the things that uh, that I don't know if you've seen them, you may or may not, but the Commonwealth War Graves gardeners uh, in the past, and I think they're still are still available now if they wish, um, uh, could be buried in the Commonwealth War Graves cemeteries if they died in service. Um, so I'm going to pronounce this wrong uh, for those that are French speakers, but Warloy Balion, and that's the only way. I, that's a very visual uh, um, uh, a version of the pronunciation. Um, there, the Commonwealth War Graves Cemetery, there, which is a communal cemetery extension, uh, there is a, a, a grouping of I think it's four, four, possibly five Commonwealth War Grave gardeners buried uh, in that uh, in that cemetery. Their headstones are just slightly different, but they certainly had that option to be buried amongst the men that they had been caring for. Um, and I quite like that imagery as well, that they, they wanted to, they'd, they'd worked in these cemeteries for such a long time that they felt this was the right place for them to be buried as well. I think that's wonderful. I mean, well deserved as well to be buried amongst the men who, uh, I, I know that in Gallipoli, there's a there's a burial of a soldier in one of the cemeteries from 1965. He was a veteran from Gallipoli. He came back to two of the battlefields 
50 years later and died of a heart attack when he stepped off the coach at Anzac Cove. And he was buried alongside his comrades in Chinookley, which is wonderful. Let's talk about the, th- the thing that strikes people the most and is probably the defining characteristic, amongst many defining characteristics, of the Commonwealth cemeteries. I'm talking about the inscriptions on the headstones because this is remarkable. We should remember that before the First World War, this, the idea of personalising a headstone of a war victim, you know, during the Napoleonic Wars, you'd lose 300 men in a battle and you'd just chuck them in a big hole and then maybe if we're lucky, someone would put a stone up saying, here lies 300 men from the, from the war. But the, the idea that a poor old soldier deserved his own grave and his own headstone and some information about him was almost revolutionary at the time, wasn't it? And the, the, key, the key feature of these headstones that just touches everyone that goes there today is the wonderful inscriptions that were written on them. Tell us about the inscriptions, where they came from, and, and, and share with us some of your favourites, Pete. Yeah, okay. So first of all, uh, um, for, uh, for a lot of the Commonwealth uh, countries, it was decided that they would not have the great swathe of regimental badges uh, and core badges that you will find on the, on the British soldier's uh, headstone. Uh, so again, uh, if you're an Australian and you're visiting the, uh, the, the the cemeteries, what becomes very ob- obvious is that there isn't just the one badge, of course, for the Australians. There's the um, what is known as the ri- Rising Sun. Um, uh, but uh, you get this vast, uh, vast array of uh, of different cat badges. So that's the first thing to say. Um, obviously, Australian soldiers buried under the uh, the rising sun. I've just mentioned because it's not a rising sun. I won't go into the detail of that, but, but just just in case I get pulled up for it, not a rising sun, um, but always known as the rising sun. Then we get uh, for the Canadians the maple leaf for uh, South Africans the springbok uh, for uh, New Zealanders it's the fern. So they're buried under uh, under a, a, a badge of some description. Everybody has a badge. Um, beneath that, you will get their. Um, the regimental number very important that identifies them even if they've got a name like myself smith makes it rather difficult and there's a lot of us so regimental number you then get the initial now interestingly that was what was laid down in this in this corporate manual is where they always say that the commonwealth war is created it said they will only have initials but uh, for those that have been onto the, the battlefields and, and the cemeteries you will see christian names over and over again so obviously they didn't stick to it and I've always believed that this is the stonemasons themselves, the guy that's chip, chipping the uh, the details out. He's obviously taking it from something. And if he can see a Christian name and he knows he can fit it in, then I think they just made a decision to uh, to put the Christian names in because there's no, it's not always officers. Uh, occasionally it is, uh, but it, but you get men as well with Christian names. Uh, so I just think it was down to the uh, to the stonemason at the time. But it should just be an initial. Then we get the surname. Uh, and then we'll get what he, what he was. So for Australians, it will say uh, um, that he's a, an infantryman um, and uh, the battalion that he's serving in, so uh, 51st Battalion or, or whatever, um, uh, so infantry. So you'll, you, you know his, uh, his job. Um, and then it will give you uh, a date of death. Now, the date of death is always, um, it, doesn't, it doesn't tell you how. And, and so what are the reasons that you die? Well, ridiculously, it's died. Uh, it's died of wounds, which you'd expect, and it's killed in action. So what is died? What is the distinction? Well, effectively, died is anything that you would normally die of in civilian life, so a heart attack or a, an illness that is not associated with the war. Then you tend to be recorded as, as died rather than died of wounds or killed in action. So those are the three distinctions, but it doesn't Say that on the headstone, uh, and again, it's part of that rhetoric. In death, you're all the same. It doesn't matter how you die; they're not going to. Uh, they don't feel that it's necessary on the headstone to to say how you died. And then the the, the final thing before we get a, uh, an inscription or not at the bottom, which I'll come to, is a, a Christian cross or not or a star of David. Those were the three uh, um, uh, images that you had the option. Of course, non-believers, nothing. Uh, Star of David, Jewish soldiers, uh, a Christian cross for all of those uh, that are of any Christian faith, didn't matter which, you got the same the same cross. And then finally, the final uh, choice was, did you wish to have a, a private inscription, an epitaph uh, uh, on the headstone? Um, but there's a difference in, in how that came about. For the British, it was three and a half um, pence a letter. For Australia, three and a half pence a letter. In fact, for everybody, three and a half pence a letter. But the Canadians decided that that didn't uh, discriminate against the poor and they would means to test. So if you couldn't afford to have a private inscription and you wished, they would help you. Um, for Britain and Australia, we in general just paid. Um, New Zealand went the opposite way. They decided that uh, 
since the poor were, they felt they were being discriminated against, nobody would have a private inscription. So New Zealand uh, graves uh, of the Great War do not have private inscriptions uh, on them. There aren't any. For Australia, interestingly, as a ratio, there are more private inscriptions on Australian headstones than anybody else. So you have to kind of ask yourself, well, why, why would that be? And... Um, I've had various variations of why people think more money. No, it's distance. It's because it's people who know they can't visit the grave. You know, it would cost almost a year's salary of the average working man to to get from Australia onto the onto the Western Front to visit a grave. So the majority of families were would would not come. Could not come even though they would, I'm sure they would love to. Um, and so let's bring something of ourselves to the, uh, to the, uh, to the, the, the battlefield, to the grave of our loved one. And so we get a lot of very, very uh, moving personal in, uh, inscriptions. Um, and I think that was the right de decision, uh, uh, was to have the inscriptions. And I think the Canadians did the right thing. It's a shame that the New Zealanders didn't, because you do get a window into loss and mourning and memory um, with these private inscriptions. And as I say, uh, you'll see more private inscriptions on Australian graves than, than uh, anybody else as a ratio of the number of war dead. So uh, very moving. And... Uh, Difficult, Matt. I know you said, uh, is there any that I'd, I'd want to point out? And I think sometimes it's it's like the cemeteries. People ask me very often, what is my favourite cemetery or where is my favourite cemetery? And it varies on my mood. It varies on the time of year. It varies on my interests. So I'm for, I, I never have a, a favourite cemetery. I, I change and, and swap depending on, on, on perhaps sometimes even what I'm studying. Uh, and it's the same with the headstones uh, and the private inscriptions. Uh, some of them are... If you're feeling a little, a little morose, a little depressed, and some of them could be absolutely, I mean, they do still have me in tears. I have to say, you no, know, I, I have to have a swallow and, uh, and walk away and have a little think and, and come back again because they are so. And especially if you have children, uh, the ones that uh, have a reference to, uh, to, to, to the, the men's children, or uh, they are, I always find them unbelievably uh, heart wrenching, and also leading to, I wonder what happened to those children. No, uh, did they have happy lives? Did the uh, did the mother remarry? Uh, did they remember him? No, and uh, again, we're back to that thing about the, the thousand and one stories that you uh, that you can learn from from the graves or not learn, uh, as uh, as the case may be. I think that's the part of the story that is the most touching for people and tells the most about that soldier is the inscription from the family. And you have to say, there's a lot of the standard king and country ones, which I can understand why. You know, we we just won a great victory. There's a lot of an awful lot of religious ones, um, but the personal ones. I mean, there's a lot from Australia that emphasise that distance you mentioned. As, you know, only son of Mr. and Mrs. Watson from Geelong. There's a lot of those, but the ones you're right, the touching ones, particularly for us Aussies. I don't want to be a one-eyed Australian, but for us Australians who've come a long way ourselves to visit these sites, when we walk those graves and you see the ones that say, you know, I saw one that said, "Far away from the land of the wattle, he lies in a hero's grave." And I, you know, just these, they just emphasize this Australianness. You know, he died for Australia. He, you know, the far away from his loved ones in a grave I cannot see, and you know, just these repeated feelings. Because you're right, it's not just the expense of in the 1920s traveling to Europe. It was the time they had to take off work. This is one thing we don't often think about. People say it was just too expensive, but a, a trip to Europe was probably six weeks on the ship. And then, you know, at least a couple of weeks, probably a month on the ground, and then another six weeks back. You're talking three or four months to do that. What worker in a suburban factory could take four months off unpaid, leave his family and head off to visit the grave of his you know, son who'd been killed five years previously? It just, it just was not going to happen. So it's another thing I say to people is that we're completing that pilgrimage on their behalf. These people never got to do it. As much as they would have loved to go and see the grave of their dearly beloved son or husband or brother, they never got the opportunity. And so we have an obligation when we go there because we are completing that pilgrimage for these people. So, you know, without getting too wishy-washy about it, you know, those emotions that, that you know, there's a, that, that we, are, we are helping to carry on that feeling even a century later. It's a really important element of, of going to these places. It is. And it's a question I always ask, especially my Australian clients. It's one of the things that I always say. Do you think you're the first person to visit this grave? And you have to say about 90 percent of the answers are yes, we are the first person to visit this grave. And it's taken two, in some cases, three generations. Um, well, in fact, sometimes four generations before before that family or the relatives of that soldier have been able to gather enough money together to actually, uh, or the will, I suppose, as well, um, to to actually uh, travel to the other side of the world to visit a grave that had not been visited before. Amazingly, amazingly emotional. 
I know it's uh, you know, for somebody to stand there in front of, uh, and I get to get very different uh, reactions from people. And it's very often the, the people that you're staunch never haven't battered an eyelid. They stand in front of their relative's grave and they become babbling heaps. Uh, and yet sometimes the person that you expect to be very very emotional. Um, it's not. Is they've they've thought about it a lot and they've had time to to, to get their loins, as they say, and they're they're ready and prepared, and so they they can they they, they do, do not get very emotional. So it, uh, yeah. And I find myself getting emotional with them. I, I think if you when you're faced with that kind of raw emotion, it is very difficult to stand there and and not be moved yourself. It must be the most wonderful thing about what we do, Pete. I, you know, I found this. I don't lead many tours these days, but when I do, if you can take a family member to a grave of their loved one and see that emotional reaction, it's just, a, it's a, I mean, it's a wrong word, but it's a thrill. It's, it's wonderful to be able to do that for someone. It is, and and of course, the the, the other thing that uh, I equally get a, a buzz from doing is 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 for those those people again. We're back to those people again who have no known grave. Well, quite often, because of the reports that uh, were created by the Red Cross, these uh, these missing inquiry bureau files, nowadays, again, they very often, sometimes, well, not very often, but sometimes give map references to where they were originally buried and sadly those graves are lost. Well, that equally can be as moving to take somebody to the last reported location of, uh, of a soldier who is now commemorated on one of the great memorials to the missing, um, but to be able to take them to where they became missing and probably or have a certain percentage, you know, they could still be in that paddock, it can be equally as moving, you know, to, to find that location and uh, and say, you know, this is the this is the paddock, this is the field, this is the, you know, the, the, this square hundred metres is is where he was originally buried and sadly lost his life and was buried. And he may be here, or as we've discussed, he may not be. He may be uh, buried in a local cemetery or even perhaps not so local as an unknown soldier. But at least you have that option then to uh, to give them a place to grieve, an actual location to grieve, as well as to go and look at their name engraved in either the uh, for the Australian soldiers, the uh, Villas Breton uh, for the missing of France, or the Menin Gate for the missing of Belgium. Uh, not forgetting, obviously, the missing of Fromel. But uh, yeah, it's one of those uh, those great memorials to go and see the names. Very well said, Pete. Just uh, we probably should wrap it up soon. But just what's the what's your feeling about the future of the cemeteries on the western front in particular and i'm, I'm going to preface this with I've been, I've been scribbling notes as we've been talking as things pop up and there's a there's a few different areas to this one of the i mean there's a i mean where do we even begin with all this but i mean we know that the cemeteries are important we know they're important memorials but they're also very very expensive and we have no direct connections anymore the wives and the mothers and the parents and the sisters are, are all gone now we we don't have we don't have that direct connection. The cemeteries no longer fulfil their original purpose, which is a place of pilgrimage for family members. And as you say, there's a huge quantity of them, nearly a 1,000 in France and Belgium, just from the First World War. Then we've got Second World War, we've got all the wars since. What's the future, do you think? Are they still going to remain important? Are they still going to remain relevant? Are we going to see a stage where the French start to object that so much of their land is occupied by these foreign cemeteries? What, what do you think is going to happen down the road? It's a very difficult question to answer, but I, I'll, I'll give my opinion now. And I have to say, you could probably ask this in 200 years' time and, and hopefully I'd like to think that you'd get a similar answer, but who knows? Um, I, I believe it will continue. I believe the funding will uh, will continue for the, the upkeep uh, of them. Um, at the moment, obviously, they are they are funded uh, and it's, uh, it's ratioed by the number of war dead from uh, each uh, Commonwealth country, that's what funds it. So it's it's our taxes for those that are, are working in a in a Commonwealth country. It's our taxes that will uh, will fund the upkeep. So as long as that goes on, then I can't see that there is going to be uh, an issue. Um, well, there shouldn't be an issue. I have to say the Commonwealth War Graves are changing. Uh, they are changing a lot. Uh, they are putting quite a lot of money into uh, information panels within the cemeteries. They are just about, I believe, it's. Maybe this year or perhaps next year, they are opening a visitor centre here in uh, Bahrain's, which is just outside of, uh, of Arras, their headquarters um, on the on the Western Front. So they're opening a visitor centre there. Um, they are also the, uh, uh, they are they are starting to. If you look at the website, and I always advise uh, people who have not uh, who have been researching relatives and for Australians tend to go to the war memorial. Um, I always say go and have a look if your relative uh, was killed on the Western Front or uh, uh, in fact at any period anywhere in the world, 
Um, then go and have a look at the Commonwealth War Graves uh, information because it, it, it appears to be ever increasing the type of information they have. And they have all sorts of added information about the battles and uh, yeah. uh, not just about the, the, the cemeteries. So I think what they are doing is changing slightly. And I can perceive a time, I think at the moment their remit is they, they're not really allowed to make money out of any of these. But I can perceive a time when I, when I would I would actually like to see it. I would like to see them producing perhaps some books and, uh, you know, and actually selling something which would aid if there is if there ever does become a problem with the upkeep of the cemeteries that uh, that they have changed uh, to make sure that, that the cemeteries are kept and, and looked after in, in the way that they are and of course their workforce is enormous and again to put it into perspective i believe that uh, the commonwealth war graves uh, uh, is the second largest employer single employer in the somme region uh, the largest, I think, is Airbus uh, in Albert. Um, so it gives, just gives you an idea of the, of the number of people that, that, are, that are employed uh, by them. And you only have to drive around here and visit the cemeteries to see the gardeners, especially in the summer when, when they appear to be working in every cemetery you visit. Um, so it, it, uh, it's a, it is a not an enormous, uh, enormous cost to keep these uh, the cemeteries uh, in the pristine condition that they are, because they are in pristine condition. And it's not just the gardeners, of course. It's stonemasons, tree surgeons, you, know, you name it, the, whatever they need, whatever the, the cemeteries were made out of, then somebody's going to make sure that it stays in that pristine condition. And, and in, in the main, they are in a pristine condition. So let's hope it, 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 it continues. And uh, um, you only have to look at, I suppose, uh, I was uh, think of Waterloo. Now, Waterloo, uh, nobody really knows if you had a relative that fought in Waterloo. You'd be very, very lucky if you did. Uh, most people go to visit the Battle of Waterloo because it's interesting. There's memorials. Very few people actually visit the, the, the actual battlefield. They go to visit the memorials associated with the, uh, with the battle. So that still is in the, in the public's eye. So I don't see why, uh, why the, these battlefields and the cemeteries associated with them would not always remain in, in, in the public eye. I have to say, it is a bit of a Anglo-Saxon trait. Is our our slight obsession with visiting the battlefields? The French don't necessarily view it in the same way. And I had a quick conversation with my next door neighbour when I first arrived here over fifteen years ago, along the lines of, "What are you doing? I'm going to be a battlefield guide and, and perhaps run a bed and br- uh, breakfast." And then his question was, "Why?" And what are they coming to see? And he'd lived here all his life. He's a bank manager, so not a not an ill-educated man. And um, and I said, well, we'll come to look at the the, the cemetery. He said, what cemeteries? And I said, well, you know, the cemeteries that are scattered all around uh, you know, this village. And he said, how that? And then you realise that the cemeteries are so embedded in the landscape here that they're not really visible to the locals any longer. They are just part of the landscape. And I think very few of them, as they whistle backwards and forwards to the supermarket or to, or to work, really even notice them. And I can't decide if that's a good thing or a bad thing. And I think it's quite moving in a way that, that they are just there. You know? and, and, and that's what I hope they always will be. I hope they always will be just here. But I have to say, it's my, my I suppose, the, the worst example, or the worst you could, that I can envisage is they are just there and nobody visits. And I think that's when there will be questions. So we're back again. We've gone full circle to 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 make sure that when you visit the cemetery, sign the visitors book because that is the worst the the worst hope I suppose or the worst uh, that we can hope for is that nobody's visiting and that this enormous amount of money is still going into them, but nobody ever goes to visit these these guys that are buried here. But I just can't envisage that. I can't envisage uh, certainly. That's why I'm saying you need to ask that question, or somebody needs to ask that question to uh, in in a couple of hundred years time and see what response you get. Well, I think we all agree that we hope that it, it does carry on because they're just such wonderful, wonderful monuments. Um, just before we wrap up, a, con- a concluding thought I wanted to, to give to people is potentially a little bit controversial, but hopefully not. I, I say to people when we go to cemeteries, all of these elements we've discussed over the last hour or so, Pete, I, I, I pass on to people when we visit cemeteries. But I think one that's, that's absolutely important that people don't forget is that these cemeteries were not created for us. They were created for pilgrims. And... Because of that, what I want to say to people is visit these cemeteries, respect them, pay your respects to the men that were there, but don't go too far, if that makes sense. The, you know, don't, don't overdo it in terms of the sacred ground because I think that's almost a problem in itself. And for example, and I think you were the one that actually told me the story, Pete, that often when you see a little bench in a cemetery, 
that was somewhere for family members to sit and have a sandwich, have a picnic. Uh, you know, they, we've got to remember there were long distances involved in the 1920s, especially across a broken battlefield. Trying to get to these cemeteries was quite an ordeal. People would arrive, they'd want to spend a few hours with their son, they wouldn't just want to turn around and go home after 10 minutes. So they'd have a little bench, a little bench in the corner where they could sit and have a sandwich and, and a cup of tea. And so sometimes you see people getting, oh my God, you could never eat in a cemetery. That would be the most disrespectful thing in the world. Or the, the, the example that I give is probably the best one is when you go to Tynecott Cemetery, that huge cemetery you mentioned in Belgium, just north of Ypres. When you go to Tynecott, the cross of sacrifice is built over the, uh, the remains of a German concrete block house. And everyone who's been there will recognize that this, it's, it's quite extraordinary. There was a German pillbox where the cemetery was, was built, and that was the, the, the site of the original cemetery that was built there. And everyone, as they say, at the suggestion of the king, they built the cross of sacrifice on top of the German blockhouse. And you can still see there's a, still a gap in the, in the stone so that you can see the concrete of the blockhouse. So really quite remarkable. And whenever I go there, particularly with school groups, I say to them, climb up on top of the cross and then you'll get an incredible panorama out across the whole Passchendaele battlefield all the way back to Ypres. And you'll see why the high ground is so important. You'll see why the Germans built blockhouses here on this ridge. And you'll just get a perspective on what looks like flat land. You'll see it's actually not flat. It's, there's quite a slope and you can see why this high ground was so important. And I've had, uh, probably every time I do it, so you've got a bunch of kids. And I've got to say, as a little aside, children that visit these cemeteries, school groups that I've taken there are incredibly respectful. I've never seen a single school child do anything except pay absolute reverent respect to these, these graves and these headstones. They know what it's about and they pay their respects. I've never seen misbehaving children in these cemeteries. But if you're standing on that cross of sacrifice with a bunch of kids pointing out the battlefield, every time I've done it, someone will come by and say, get down from there, you can't climb up on that cross. That's incredibly disrespectful. And what I say is, see those little, those little terraces cut into the side of it? Those are steps. Those are steps from the ground leading to the top. The designers of this cemetery intended that you would climb to the top and look out on the battlefield. It, it, in fact, the, the, the top one is a seat. It is designed for you to sit there, for you to sit on that top one and contemplate the cemetery. It's all about contemplation and sitting there and looking. So you're, you're absolutely right. I think my and I think my my more rather long-winded point is just that we can get too precious about these things. And if if the architect who built the cemetery was wanted people to come into his cemetery and climb up on that cross and look out on the battlefield and look out across the cemetery, or if they put a bench in the corner so that you could sit and rest and nibble on a sandwich while paying your respects, I just don't think, you know, a hundred years removed, it's up to us to uh, tell them they were wrong. So I just, I, I just want to put that out there to people. To, it's, it's wonderful that we go to these cemeteries and, do, and we do respect them and pay your respects at these cemeteries, but don't go too far. Don't get too precious about it. Remember why they were put there, who they were built for and what the intention was of these cemeteries in the first place. I agree entirely with what you're saying. And in fact, it's, uh, you're, you're exactly in line with what I say. And in fact, uh, the only two things that I dislike um, uh, would be dogs and, uh, and footballs. Other than that, uh, I, I, I even, uh, I mean, sometimes you get young children chasing each other in between the graves. And uh, I don't even have a problem with that, you know, laughing and giggling. In the main, these are young men that died under terrible circumstances and uh, and end up uh, sadly remaining and being buried in these in these cemeteries. And I often think, what would they like to do? Well, I think a what they would like is that people visited, and hearing children laugh uh, is something that certainly, if I was uh, uh, in one of the cemeteries, then that's what I would like to know that there were people above me carrying on with life and and, and enjoying themselves and visiting me. Um, and so uh, yeah, so I. I'm not precious on the cemeteries. Dogs not keen on, um, obviously associated with the mess and uh, footballs. I think are just taking it a little step too far. But other than that, no, no. And certainly, as as I said earlier, driving around with a flask of cof uh, coffee, finding a nice little cemetery with a seat where you are not even sitting on the wall, but with a seat, even better, sitting there and having a, a, a flask of coffee. I don't see that as a, or a sandwich as a slightest bit uh, disrespectful. In fact, if anything, it's the opposite. You're you're wanting to spend your 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 leisure time, your coffee and your sandwich with the guys that are, are, are within the cemetery. You're absolutely right, Peter. And when you sit there and nibbling on your sandwich or having a cup of coffee and just looking out across the cemetery, firstly, those are some of the most moving moments when you just get to reflect. But also, there's not just the ghosts of the soldiers that are in those cemeteries. There's the ghosts of all the pilgrims that have been there as well over the last decades. And you're sharing a moment with them as well. I think it's really wonderful. I think I think going there, remembering the pilgrims, remembering the soldiers, it's just it's just a wonderful part of the whole experience. 
And to me, in my uh, little archive of photographs that I have, I have many pictures of men, and they're normally dressed the same. They have their gabardine max on. They have their trilby hats on their heads. They're arm in arm. They're comrades. And you can clearly see under one arm, they've got a sandwich box, and sticking out their pockets is a bottle of brown. Um, and they're going to visit their mates in the, in, in the cemetery. So I, I feel myself following in that tradition. I agree, Pete. Thank you so much for your time. It's been really wonderful. Just a great insight. And this this is a podcast. I mean, we've gone over an hour. It probably could have gone for three or four hours by the time we finish. But <laughs> as I said to everyone listening at the top of the show, do yourself a favor. If you're going to the battlefields, um, you know, if you book with our company, Pete will be the, the number one uh, guide on the list. So hopefully you'll end up with Pete. But uh, walking the battlefields with Pete Smith, as I think you can see from this little taste, is just an extraordinary experience. So Pete, thank you so much. It's always a wonderful pleasure to catch up with you. And just thanks for your wonderful insights. No, pleasure, Matt. Been, uh, been, been great to have a chat.